Hello and welcome to this India Today special. India, it would seem, has been the flavor of the season in the backdrop of the G20 summit. But are we truly a rising economic power as is being projected? Or are there many mountains left to climb? Joining us now is someone who has a ringside view from a global perspective to what's happening in India and the world. I'm joined by Dr. K. Subramaniam, the executive director of the IMF uh, for India, as well as the former chief economic advisor. Appreciate your joining us, Dr. Subramaniam. Good to have you here in India. My pleasure, Rajti. Uh, you know, the G20 summit has created a lot of buzz around rising India. The fact that we've emerged from the 10th largest economy in the world to the fifth, and the hope that we will reach third in a few years. How much of that hype do you believe is deserved? And how much does it conceal certain other concerns uh, in your view? Uh, Rajdeep, you would recall uh, the interview that we had just after the first quarter of 2020. At that time, I had said that there's going to be not only a V-shaped recovery after the uh, pandemic-induced lockdown, that the economic growth in India will be very, very good. So it is not just that we required a G20 to, you know, to, to basically tell the world that India is rising. India's growth, if you look at 7.2% last year, and when the revised numbers will come in, you know, it is my estimation that the growth will be closer to 7.5%. With the first quarter growth being 7.8%, India has been, you know, uh, doing really well. And the G20, in particular, really signals the stature that India has now come to command in the world, in the you know, Committee of Nations. When you look at the fact that a unanimous declaration was uh, you know, signed, uh, a very seminal um, proposal and you know, something that everybody agreed to, which is the corridor, the infrastructure corridor, uh, which I have called it the new Silk Route, um, together with the, uh, you know, India displaying leadership on financial inclusion, on the public digital infrastructure, um, and also on, on cryptocurrency. I think these are very, very important moves, clearly. So I, any doubts that people like you would have had must should, you know, should have been settled by now. But I must still raise, uh, you know, my job is to raise the question. So I will continue to raise the question. Two doubts that emerge from what you just mm -hmm. said. One, when you cite GDP numbers, mm -hmm. the, fight, uh, the fact is those numbers also conceal possibly the reality that we've emerged from a low base. Uh, there are economists who say that if you if you discount the fact that we've emerged from a low base during the COVID years, go back to 2019-20, we are still at an average of 3.5 uh, growth rate, which is a low to middling growth rate. So how much is that 7% plus conceal the fact that we are emerging from a very low base in the COVID years? So, you know, there are a few problems with this, Rajdeep. Firstly, and I'm sure you would have seen, I had written a piece in the Times of India where I had shown the growth um, not only for India but for the top 10 countries um, over a three-year period, taking into account the base effect, taking into account the fact that during the you know, uh, pandemic year, every country, not only India, had a growth decline um, and shown that India had the largest growth during this three-year period over the top 10 economies, uh, point number one. Second point, um, I think you would, re you know, you'd remember very well um, when, when you know, uh, we had made the prediction about the V-shaped recovery, people were basically didn't, you know, didn't even believe it at that point in time. So, you know, if they are talking about now the base effect and having at that time not believed that there will indeed be, you know, the base effect coming about because of the V-shaped recovery, I think you can't have it both you ways. You see, right? see the, even the word V. <laughs> Even the word V generates controversy. There are those who suggest it's more like K-shaped. There are certain areas where we've grown, other areas where, where we have not. I mean, indigenous I, manufacturing still hasn't perhaps picked up to the extent that one would like it to. Yeah. Uh, there are still question marks over certain uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. So therefore, are you willing to concede that maybe rather than being gung-ho over a V-shaped recovery, mm -hmm. it's a more gradual K-shaped recovery? No, so actually, and I've said this before, Rajdeep, and I'm just, I think um, it's important to, be, to repeat this, that this argument or this claim that, you know, the recovery is K-shaped is disingenuous. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. Uh, because even in 
any year, um, you know, the best years or in a crisis year, growth across sectors is never uniform. Like the five fingers in a hand, they're actually of different sizes. If you take any year, you know, it's not as if manufacturing services and agriculture grow at the same rate. So, you know, this is something that's an intrinsic feature of an economy always. So, mm -hmm. you know, just to then say that for the particular time of the pandemic, growth rates are different and therefore it's a K-shaped recovery, I think makes it very, very clear that the argument is disingenuous. Um, now, if you look at even specifically the crisis period, take the previous crisis for instance, the global financial crisis. During that time, it was actually manufacturing, you know, that, that did well, services did not do as much. It, in fact, actually, it was the other way around. Um, now, that is also, you could have, people could have called that a K-shaped recovery or whatever the, it was. Mm -hmm. So, my point here is that it is not a characteristic of just the COVID period. Any year you pick up, you show me a particular year, you know, not, not only for India or any other economy where every sector has grown at the same rate, I will then you know, stop calling myself an economist. You know, because the fact is that when you throw numbers at us, particularly the GDP numbers, there are those who say those numbers do not uh, give the complete picture of this country, A, because of the low base that I mentioned, B, which, which also I, because they don't no, account no, for the unorganized no, agriculture no, 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 sector, uh, non uh, unorganized non-agriculture sector, which in a way is the one which has hurt the most in the post-COVID period. Rajdeep, I know when I actually give you an argument, you, you, yes. you mentioned about the base effect and I actually showed, told you the data that over a three-year period, India among the large economies accounting for the base effect has had the best growth. So please accept that argument and then let's move on. You know, mm -hmm. I think that claim is actually is not on very solid ground. Mm -hmm. I think India indeed has displayed very good, uh, you know, growth uh, out of recovery, out of COVID because, and here I think it's not, a, it's not an accident that India has had actually such good performance because we anticipated, unlike any of the other economies, that COVID is going to be a big supply side shock. Talk. And the measures that were taken actually were a good balance of both the demand and the supply side measures, which is why, you know, you know, in my you know, time where because the twin crisis, both the COVID and the Ukraine war, you have advanced economies facing between two and a half to four times their historical average inflation. India's inflation has been actually less than its historical average. So not only have we come out with very strong macroeconomic fundamentals, unlike the fragile five performance during the global financial crisis, we've also had very strong growth. So I don't think we need a, we needed a G20 as actually a proof of the recovery. G20, as I've, I know, as I've said, is essentially just signaling the stature that India has now come to command in the you know, global community. I'll come to the G20 in a moment, but the unorganized non-agriculture mm -hmm. sector is the one which is seen to have suffered the most in COVID times, led to unemployment, led to falling incomes. Mm -hmm. And there, isn't, there aren't signs yet of a complete recovery. Do you believe that will be a more slower recovery? That remains the major challenge going ahead. So here, you know, if you look at, and there are, there, there are enough academic studies now. If you look at the paper by Dr. Arvind Panagariya, the former mm -hmm. vice chairman of Niti Aayog, he's actually used data showing, you know, the fact that recovery, you know, if you separate by urban versus rural areas, looking at employment as well, you know, recovery has indeed now been complete. If you look at the PLFS data, if you look at employment, employment has already recovered beyond pre-COVID levels. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, when you let the data speak, rather Rather than go for particular narratives, I think the claims that you're making are clearly they do not have any ground. You mentioned G20 and the fact that the G20 in a sense reflects uh, what you believe is India's emergence as mm -hmm. a leading economy. Now, there yeah. will be those who will say, yes, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. But even among the G20, we have the lowest per capita income yeah. that we are the country with the maximum number of poor. 16.4% of our population remains below, uh, below yeah. the poverty line. The next is uh, South Africa with about 6.4%. Mm -hmm. These are real concerns again going ahead. Inequalities remains a major concern. No, look, here as well, I think let's go by the... So for a population of 1.4 billion, clearly, you know, when you have a, a, a base like that, obviously per capita income in dollar terms when you compare actually will be you know will, will, will be lower but the right way to compare is to compare always is using purchasing power parity because the dollar what it can purchase let's say you know uh, in in the US versus what it can do in India is different right the, mm -hmm. you know and 
in when you use purchasing power parity india does not look you know as uh, um, uh, uh, sort of as as behind in terms of per capita you know when you come to uh, look at that uh, compared to other countries that's point number 1 second when you talk about inequality i think you know because of the inclusive nature of growth especially through the you know uh, digital infrastructure that that india has created now we have more than 500 million bank accounts and each of these bank accounts are being used by the poor mm -hmm. so uh, through the use of the public digital infrastructure india has been able to really make growth inclusive and this is being shown if you you know i refer to the paper uh, by Dr. Arvind Panagaria, where he actually shows that inequality, if anything, has actually declined during the you know the last three four years. Inequality has not gone up, and this is using the PLFS data again. So when you look at the data carefully, some of the claims actually, which are sort of narratives that are spun, I think, do not have as much. So power. you don't accept the fact that income inequalities remains the major challenge going ahead. That that for a country like India, as we sort of you know project ourselves to the world as this mm -hmm. fastest growing economy that will remain the big challenge uh, you know even when i look income inequalities and uh -huh. then, then i come to social sector which is health and education if you yep. look at a per capita investment in education yes. per capita income in health we are the lowest still among the g20 countries so critical areas still remain before we can truly claim to be in a sense the rising power that we now hope to become one day so I think you know we have to be very careful here to not keep moving the targets here. Mm -hmm. First, when you started out, we actually were talking about the macroeconomics. We're talking about growth. I don't. I don't think anybody here is going to contend that there is no work to be done. Mm -hmm. Let's be very clear. You know, when I'm talking about inequality, I'm talking about the change in inequality because the narrative that a lot of you know people those especially those that are sympathetic to your kind of arguments. No, the, let uh, me my finish. argument no, no, Rajdi, is to let ask me the questions. Let me, Rajdi, let me finish. Actually, yes, I'm not ahead. talking about you. I'm talking about those economists that are actually sympathetic to your kind of arguments. You know, they basically contended that inequality is rising. I'm not saying inequality in terms of the level is something that we should not be working on. We certainly should be. But what I'm saying, when you look at the data and r papers written by very credible people like Dr. Arvind Panagaria, during this three-year period, inequality has has not gone up. That is what I'm saying. And not saying inequality is something that we should not be working on. Because there are when papers also written by the likes of Professor Arun Kumar, Professor Marotra, are, who, have a, who have a very different perspective. Wh why? Because those are actually based on data that are not reliable, the CMI data. The PLFS data, we know very well, it is created by the, you know, by the NSSO, which is you know, tasked with the job of you know, creating data for the country. CMI is private data, which I've, I've said time and again, even when good news comes on employment, I say that is unreliable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those papers that you're talking about are actually written with unreliable data. I don't trust the findings that come from there. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, when it comes to social sector expenditure, I completely agree with you. We have work to do. And in fact, if you would recall in the 2020-21 economic survey, we wrote a chapter on healthcare showing that we need to increase our spending. We need to do, you know, clearly, clearly a lot. I don't think anybody, those of us who actually, you know, really want to speak the truth on the economy, we're not saying that there is no work to be done and uh, what we are trying to say is that there is this class of you know of, of perennial pessimists who keep moving the targets when we say okay you know first they said oh growth is going to be terrible there are going to be millions of people dying on the streets in India when growth happens they say oh what about this I am trying to say that those of us who actually want to portray the truth on the economy, we want to tell them that actually don't keep moving targets. Let's acknowledge the good work that is done. That doesn't mean that there is not, there isn't more work to be done. There's absolutely more work to be done, but there's been absolutely very good work done. So as well. therefore, when you look at, let's say, the glass half empty theory of the perennial pessimists, as you call them, would you tell them that the real challenge that you also accept is ensuring that expenditure on health and education in particular, providing not just... Uh, uh, literacy, uh, increasing literacy rates, but ensuring that you're able to provide quality education that makes them competitive for the new job market. That's going to be India's biggest challenge going ahead, skilling and ensuring greater investment in health and education. So, see, here I think, you know, I, I don't think any economist is, very, is going to go and claim that we actually have, you know, done everything that needs to be done on education and healthcare. Mm -hmm. But let me remind, you know, especially the viewers that education and healthcare are actually not just the responsibility of the center. They're actually concurrent subjects, number one. 
Number two, when it comes to education, the solution is not more money because our teachers, especially those in government, you know, are paid well. And if you look back, look at several papers, people like you know uh, uh, Karthik Murali there and others have actually written showing that it is the governance that needs to change, which is primarily a state level subject. Number one. So, mm -hmm. but the, again, I'm just saying, you know, who needs to do the work? I'm not saying there isn't work to be done on healthcare as well. I think while there's been significant improvement, and I let me acknowledge, you know, we on a per capita basis during COVID, I think we did really well uh, by coming up with our own vaccine. You know, I shudder to think about actually, let's say, in a different dispensation, the kind of policy paralysis that prevailed earlier, what would have been the situation? You know, if the same COVID pandemic had happened in sort of such kind of dispensation, I think there would have been absolute mayhem. Um, you know, and I think that is important to actually recognize. In the spirit of, you know, recognizing wherever good work has been done, I think we must say that too. The, the other challenge challenge, of course, which I briefly mentioned upon was manufacturing. And since you quoted Arvind Panagriya more than once, his big concern mm -hmm. is that the PLI schemes that the government has brought in, uh, that we need to relook at some of them, that we need to ensure uh, that uh, somewhere customs du uh, duty hikes need to be reversed. We can't be protectionist in this new world. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to ensure that trade barriers are lifted. We're going to have to reach out to the world. Do you concede that perhaps that is another major challenge going ahead if we have to really compete with the global economies? Yeah, I, you know, on manufacturing, there is actually a lot of work still to be done. Um, let me explain, you know, to our viewers, because this is something that's generated debate. Let me you know, in 1991, and allow me actually to explain this here, mm -hmm. please don't interrupt. Um, in 1991, we liberalized the economy. But what we did not do was, you know, really sort of work on ex work, you know, on, on those factors of production that manufacturing firms use. For instance, manufacturing firms need power. Manufacturing firms need land. Manufacturing firms need labor. They also need, you know, to transport their, 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 their uh, what they produce. And their scale needs to be big enough so that their costs can be spread over a large denominator. Each of these are costs that manufacturing firms incur. And our policy has actually, you know, we did not do anything on these in these factor markets to actually enable our firms to be competitive. What happens is our manufacturing firms on each one of these inputs, they face anywhere between 15 to 20 percent higher costs than global firms. Mm -hmm. When you add all these up, you basically are looking, our firms are looking at almost double the cost. Even the most, you know, creative entrepreneur can possibly reduce his or her costs by 20, 30 percent. But when the cost is actually double, and this is something that actually has been a policy failure, which has been, you know, uh, which this government has tried to address. If you look at the labor reforms, actually, the bill has been passed, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Parliament. The economies of scale, actually, we had the problem of dwarfism. Firms actually, you know, growing old, but not growing in size, thereby really reaping economies of scale. That has not happened, had not happened, has now actually been changed, MSME definitions. The infrastructure spending that is happening has been happening in power and has been happening, you know, in, 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 in roads and railways so that logistics costs you know, are, are, are taken care of. Now, when you put all this together, it's there is nobody has a magic wand It's not going to happen overnight. But actually, the momentum is, is very much there. If you look at the latest, the monthly economic report that the Ministry of Finance has put up, it, they show very clearly that private investment, that is new private investment into manufacturing is really actually, you know, is, is at a 14 year high, year high. So clearly there is, you know, good work that is being done, but there's a lot more work still to be done on, on manufacturing. One final uh, uh, contentious issue is the charge of cronyism. The charge that few are benefiting at the many, that mm -hmm. many of these infrastructure projects are going to only a handful of, of businessmen. And the real fear that it appears that many of our dollar millionaires are actually leaving the country, are looking to park their money outside India, whether it's in a Dubai, whether it's in a Singapore, and that should worry you. If all is so well, why is it that so many people are, are, are looking at options outside India? And do you really accept, uh, do you believe that the charge of cronyism uh, should be looked at seriously or not? So you've asked me two questions here. Let me take your second question first, which is about, you know, uh, people leaving, etc. Let me, I'll give you an honest assessment here. Uh, and they seem to be fearful of, of, of the fact that the laws do not equally apply. So let me, you know, uh, uh, as I was saying, in terms of people basically wanting to leave the country. Look, I lived in the United States from 2001 to 2010. Mm -hmm. And now I'm for the last eight months, I'm living in the United States again. And, you know, I've tweeted about this and I'm being absolutely honest. When I lived from 2001 to 2010, 
you know, when I was seeing what is happening in the United States, I would not see something in India that made me say, oh, wow, this is actually much better in India than in the United States. But today, when I live in the United States, there are multiple things, including being able to actually use my phone to pay for something, actually, whether I drink a co piece of coconut water or maybe a coffee, I can do that far better in India than actually in the United States. Now, just one aspect. So, I so don't our know. Digital infrastructures are big, public digital infrastructures are big strength. Our fear is the way laws are applied in this country, unequally applied uh, laws that are seen to be draconian, fear of, uh, uh, of uh, punitive action, all of which is driving money out. Uh, so, as I said here, you know, if you look at the evidence on this, on a, you know, if you normalize using the correct pace, I don't think this phenomenon actually is as, you know, as, as bad as you're portraying it to be. I'm, I will admit that I've not look at, looked at the data on this particular, so I will not speculate, mm -hmm. but I don't trust what you're actually telling me here. Okay, I'm, I'm going by the reports that have come out. In 2023, 6,500 Indian millionaires expected to leave India, according to the Henley Private Wealth Migration Report. These are numbers coming out, but also anecdotally, when you talk to businessmen, there is a fear factor. There is a fear so, factor so me, that in, will institutions operate, institutions operate in a equal, effective manner. See, th th I, that's what I mentioned. When you look at raw numbers, right, you have to use a certain base because just 6,500 in and itself, when you have population growing itself, without a certain normalization of the base, those numbers mean nothing really. You have to be careful in actually mm -hmm. in interpreting these numbers. It may be 6,500 actually, but if you go to a time, let's say 20 years back, you know, where the population was very different, you know, may, the number may, be, may have been 5,000 actually, so you can't really interpret that. Arbitrariness in implementation of law. Is, 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 is. That is something which actually state capacity, you know, in is is an aspect that India has to work on. It's not something that has been a problem just now. It has been a problem always. Right. We need to really, you know, work on improving state capacity significantly in the country. That's as, apart from, as I said, continued work on manufacturing, continued work on, you know, some of the infrastructure, healthcare, education. Also, state capacity is something that requires work. I'm not going to deny that at all. Again, the spirit of what I'm trying to say is actually this, you know, one, not acknowledging what is happening well, and moving the targets all the time. Oh, growth happened. Okay, tell me about social expenditure. If I say social expenditure, okay, tell me about something else about the laws. And that's what you know. I'm trying to actually, you know, fair, uh, uh, fair, fair so, point. Uh, fair point, Mr. Subramanian. So what now about, let me come what to about the cro cronyism. cronyism. Yeah. So again, here, you know, if you want to talk about cronyism, we could do a two-hour session. You know, because I've written a lot about this. You know, uh, the the economic surveys earlier. Entire slowdown that we had, you know, starting, you know, before 2018 19 was because of the gargantuan amount of crony lending that was done up until 2013. So, you know, again, this is an aspect that actually, you know, uh, uh, we need to really be working on, you know, moving forward. We remember are still a 75 year old democracy. And, you know, institutional checks and balances are evolving. Things are becoming clearly much, much better than what they were 10 years back. You know, I don't think anybody would want to contend that this is something that is completely taken care of. There is still work to be done. But I can tell you, and having been in the North Block, and I speak my mind, I will tell you that, you know, there is not a single instance of, you know, public sector banks basically getting a telephone call and saying lend to X or lend to Y that has happened in the last nine years. I think that is a step in the right direction, sure. which is certainly not indicative of cronyism. Therefore, as I conclude, a few days ago, we interviewed one of your colleagues, your deputy MD, Geeta Gopinath, mm -hmm. and she said India will be the world's third largest economy mm -hmm. by 27-28. It will contribute 15% of global growth this year and will be a key driver of economic growth in the years to come. Do you have any reservations or do you believe that is the way to look at the Indian economy as a glass half full? No, I would. So again, let me, you're trying to put words in my mouth that I actually will not agree with. I'm saying that Unlike some of the perennial critics, you know, seem to believe there's been a lot of good work that's been done. There are people who actually contend that, you know, becoming the third is basically a, a foregone conclusion. I don't agree with that because, you know, uh, and, and when I say that, I actually say it in a positive way. We will become the, you know, the third largest economy, but that will be because of the good work that's been done over the last nine years, not mechanically, which is what some people make it make it seem like because last you, nine years or the last uh, or the years since I, 1991. 
the, the we started in 1991 i think you know and give i give a lot of credit for the prime minister then pv narasimha rao for actually doing what he did and i have written about it the 1991 was a seminal moment at the same time what the work that has been done over the last 9 years after the lost decade of 2004 to 2014 is seminal work as well and Where that we is pulled what out the maximum number of people out of poverty between 2004 14 what you're calling the lost decade we made mistakes blunders no doubt terrible blunders terrible yeah. blunders and i actually have mentioned i think you know it very well when the tide rises you know without doing anything boats go up mm -hmm. that whatever growth that we had at that time was because the global economy before the global financial crisis was just a rising tide without doing any work with the policy paralysis as well we got growth so i don't think we not we need to claim claim credit for just what we got lucky about okay uh, when we come to the work that's happened over the last 9 years that is what has gotten us to the fifth largest economy because because if you recall the brics you know that coinage that was done of that brics there are many countries if you take brazil you look at china russia they are basically not showing the kind of growth that india has shown so to say that you know the fifth was basically something becoming the fifth largest economy was mechanical and therefore becoming the third largest economy also is going to be mechanical as some people who actually one would believe should know that economics are contending is clearly wrong we will become the third largest economy and i have absolutely no doubt about that because of the good work that we've done over the last 9 years and hopefully we'll continue to do dr subramanian as always combative and uh, most educative so thank you very much for joining us here on india today My thank pleasure. you that was the imf executive director for india in washington dc dr subramanian giving us his perspective on the road ahead If you like the video do like comment share and subscribe